All right, so every year CNET has a tradition of spending a month out of the summer devoted to what they call a road trip. It's an exploration of technology uh, outside the confines of Silicon Valley and the traditional technological institutions that we always cover regularly on this show and that CNET covers on their site. Rochelle Garner is one of the editors of an important story uh, with that series, part of this year's road trip, and she joins us now. Welcome, Rochelle. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. It's great to have you here. So, uh, obviously, this is a pretty important topic here. Tell us a little bit about the scene in Greece and why your team traveled there uh, for this piece. Sure. Well, first off, Greece is just the kickoff story that we have for a whole summer-long project. It starts with Greece. We've already run a few stories on France, and soon we're also going to be including stories from the Nordic countries, Finland and Sweden. Germany and Hungary, and also what's happening here in the United States. So it really is a month-long project that started with Greece. And the whole idea from the, our editor-in-chief was to find out with tech really permeating everything that we do in our lives, is it helping um, and how is it helping the refugee crisis in Europe, if it is at all? And that's especially important right now because we've seen more numbers have just come out. There are many more people who are stranded in Europe seeking asylum and also some of the conditions that are being reported are less than humane. So we've really been exploring how tech is affecting both how people see um, the asylum seekers around them and how it's helping the asylum seekers themselves. You're showing some images from Greece. That is, uh, these are tech encampments impromptu tent encampments of thousands of people sort of like popping up. This is in the middle of uh, the Port de Pereos that you're showing right now. About five weeks after our reporters left, the um, Greek government evicted everybody. Wow. Mm. Wow, that's insane. Um, what? So what exactly are the opportunities that um, are to be found for refugees using this kind of technology? What can they They're find? Really it really depends on the country. Um, Greece, as you probably know, is really hard hit economically, and it is having a great deal of difficulty even trying to process these people. What happened in Greece is that all of the borders shut down, and so 57,000 people are stranded, literally stranded in Greece. And Greece, the government, is, is really struggling to process people. So that's why you see these tent cities pop up in places like the a shutdown international airport. At the same time, anarchists are using WhatsApp and Facebook and, and underground uh, websites to basically take over unused and abandoned buildings and put refugees up in those. And they're completely illegal, but in many cases, they're better humane conditions than what they can get from official government mm -hmm. camps. And how was it in France? What was the experience there? Um, not so pleasant, actually. <laughs> Uh, it turns out that people, one of the biggest camps there is called the jungle. It's all men. They wouldn't have any uh, children or, or women in that. It's really quite uh, shy of horrific, but that might not be overstating it that much. And the one thing that's helping in that particular camp is there is a Wi-Fi bus. These people need access to the Internet because that is their only connection to people back home to try to find out how to get to where they want to go. In France, they don't want to stay there. They, many of them want to move on to the UK. And this is their attempt to try to find out what's going on, how to get there. By the way, the government has shut down. There's no electricity. They shut everything down. And so everything is really kind of black market. The only way you can charge your phones is with um, generators, private generators. Wow. So they have, electric they have no electricity, but they have Wi-Fi. Correct. Because uh, Wi-Fi, in many cases, is, is maybe more important than electricity, at least pervasive electricity, because this is how they find out what's going on, how to connect with people. It is their only connection to those that they love. Wow, that's, um, that's incredible. So back in 2011, the UN made a claim that Internet access is a human right. And I know, you know that's come up on this network plenty of times. Uh, do you kind of see this scenario as an example that kind of proves that theory? It does seem that way. I could, uh, hearing some examples, for example, of, of France is a case in point, but they absolutely are de dependent on Wi-Fi. Um, some of our reporters have, are still coming back. They've just returned from Germany and from Hungary and from Serbia. And they're finding, too, it's the only way that people can find out, can they get asylum? This is the, the, the point of asylum seekers is the opportunity to live legally 
somewhere in the EU. And without internet access, without the apps that are working, they're stuck. They can't go any further. If you look at it that way, that is truly a basic human right. Are there any ways that the kind of the promise of technology has has failed uh, people in these scenarios? So far, our reporters are showing that it has failed in Greece. Again, as I mentioned, the government has has some economic difficulties They're on the verge of economic collapse. They had attempted to use Skype as a way to register asylum seekers. It became a thing where you had to register through Skype. But the internet doesn't work in most places. And so refugees would find themselves trying to have to call Skype over and over. They have no internet minutes. It costs them five euros a day to try to get internet uh, minutes, which might not sound like much, but it is if you're really work living hand to mouth. For sure. And they might make 20, 30 phone calls and it didn't get through. So there was a failure there. Mm -hmm. So someone in our chat room is asking, how, uh, how is their Wi-Fi with no electricity? I think you mentioned the Wi-Fi buses. Is that mostly how they were getting Wi-Fi? That's exactly it. They are able to, like, as I said, private generators, I think they pay something like four euros for the right to be able to charge their phones a day. Not exactly inexpensive. So that's how they can charge their phones, but all internet access comes from that bus that's parked outside the camp. Wow. Um, so obviously you've got a lot more coverage kind of, kind of posting throughout the month, I imagine, right? Through the end of, of August? Yes, and probably somewhat into uh, September as well. We're kind of anticipating maybe 50 stories coming out of this package. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, this is this whole series, I, I mean, I used to work at CNET years ago. I remember Daniel Turneman, uh, when he was with CNET, he used to go out every every summer on the road trip and it was always a fascinating journey to kind of follow along and see throughout the you know throughout the course of travels through just the united states you know the stories that were dug up and now it really seems like you're taking this uh to the next level and making it kind of a global effort it's very very impressive we want to show that journalism matters whether mm -hmm. it happens to be from the general press or for the tech press we think we're doing a job a good job of it yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. CNET.com slash road dash trip. I don't know if road trip works, but road dash trip uh, to go directly uh, that's, there. That's, yes, that's right. CNET.com backslash road dash trip. Excellent. Oh. Rochelle Garner, really appreciate you coming on today and telling us all about this. And we hope that uh, a lot of a lot of the fans of the show will rush on over and read your stuff. Appreciate My pleasure. It. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye.